Hi, and welcome to Data Futurology. You should listen to this podcast if you want to learn about the future of data from industry leaders um, across multiple different industries. My name is Felipe Flores. I am your host. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we have a really exciting guest. His name is Dan Costanza, and he is the chief data scientist at Citibank. Dan is based in New York at the moment through uh, COVID working from home, him and his team, obviously, and luckily staying safe. It was an excellent conversation with Dan. And what you'll find uh, is that his perspectives, his approaches are excellent. And um, I was really keen to pick his brain because he's risen through the ranks so quickly. So he's, you know, a young guy in his mid thirties. Um, he, he has maybe about a decade or just over a decade um, of working experience. And, and he is chief data scientist at Citibank. Um, huge, huge organization. He's been built teams in multiple countries. Uh, he's linked them. He's worked in uh, at least three of the major uh, financial institutions, uh, major institutions at a global level, um, being Barclays, Goldman Sachs, and now uh, Citibank. So he is a, a wealth of knowledge, fantastic approaches. Uh, his outset, uh, his mindset, uh, and his perspectives will give you a lot of information to, to um, digest for ages. So get ready to take some notes. Here is a conversation with Dan Costanza. Hi, this is Felipe Flores. Today I'm speaking with Dan Costanza. Mate, how are you doing today? Thanks for coming on the show. I'm doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh man, I've been looking forward to speaking with you. I am so keen to pick your brain. Um, you've you've had you know such a such a um, successful career uh, already, and and you're you're a, a young guy, and so I'm I'm definitely keen to to hear your your tips and your your secrets and things. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask you about the the origin origin story. How how did you get um, interested in data in the first place? And, and um, how was the, the early part of, of your journey into the space? Yeah, um, I think my first real interactions with data were in college where um, I'd taken a bunch of statistics and along the way stumbled across the field of sabermetrics, which is basically using data to analyze baseball and um, create an independent study with one of my professors at, I went to a small liberal arts school called Williams College, had this great professor, Stephen Miller, who, um, helped me set up this independent study, and we did some work for the San Diego Padres that was um, the baseball team here in, in the U.S., and um, had a lot of fun with that, and I wrote my thesis around a, around a um, sabermetrics data type of uh, area, and wow. after I graduated, I just went into investment banking and was doing a traditional investment banking role, um, wasn't really using some of the data stuff, and um, had a, had an interesting project that came along that got me started down that path and have been heading down that way ever since. I started out trying to be a physics major and that didn't go very well. Um, so I did that for for a semester and then yeah. uh, I took, so at, at Williams at the time, math and statistics were actually a joint major. Um, huh. And so I took, I was an economics major and a math major, which is most people who do that are math majors who need to bring their GPA up a little bit. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, and, and look, you, know, you learn a lot of interesting stuff along the way in economics as well. Um, but within the math track, so Williams is a very uh, liberal arts heavy school, so it's very non-vocational. Um, you, but the math major, you have a lot of the traditional core hard math, abstract algebra, um, you know, going down with uh, differential equations, real analysis, all the, the regular stuff. And then you basically branch out from there into your senior and junior electives. And um, I just, not by any real intent, was taking the things that were really interesting to me and where I felt like I was being challenged and learning a lot. And mm -hmm. a lot of those turned out to be statistics classes. And I found it was just really cool to be able to take these things and instead of answering more theoretical questions, actually take math and use it to explain the world in a real way. And that to me was just really fascinating. The concept of just how you work on a big picture code related project like that was something I hadn't done. So you know, as a as someone who didn't study computer science in college, going mm -hmm. into this field, 
very much has been a heavy lift in terms of getting my computer science capabilities up to up to par. And that was really the first time that I interacted with a really coding heavy project where I had to build um, more than just a piece of code that answered one question. And so learning how to break up a project like that, modularize it and, and work through it was interesting. And then also learning how do you really think about um, sampling data in a way that's unbiased in a world where, you know, what I was working on at the time was looking at uh, economic efficiency of baseball betting markets. Mm -hmm. And to do that, what I was basically trying to estimate was how well do betting markets predict the probabilistic outcomes of games. And so what I was doing on the other side was predicting the probabilistic outcomes of games and seeing if you could create what is effectively like alpha on that using just simple statistical techniques. And to be able to do that in a way that you could properly use historical data without just infitting your, your information was interesting, particularly because there's a real heavy time trend to that data. So when you're looking at you know, baseball statistics, well, if batting averages move through time, um, you know, how do you properly sample your historical data for your testing and training to get a real representative use case that you can create? Um, and so I spent a ton of time on that, and that was uh, a real learning experience for me. For sure, and that uh, uh, a learning experience I'm sure has uh, served you well throughout your your career. That's a really um, important point to to cover and uh, to continue to to think about in your yes. work. And um, from there, why why or how did you um, decide to go into investment banking? Um, I have no idea. So my uh, <laughs> my roommate at the time, uh, who was an awesome guy. Um, he was preparing to do investment banking interviews and he had me uh, helping him just do some practice interviews. And I was kind of going over the questions with him and we were solving these brain teasers. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, why don't I show up and do these too? Um, and I, uh, you know, I managed to get a job working uh, as an intern in, in an investment bank and um, called my parents and told them about this. And my dad hung up on me. Um, he was like, you know, I called him later. He was like, what the? the fuck are you doing? You, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing something like, you know, my, my dad's a carpenter. My mom is a special education teacher. My sister uh, is a teacher. My other sister works in energy efficiency. And then, you know, I'm this black sheep. And they were like, what are you doing? Um, but, you know, I did my internship in it, um, learned a lot. It was a really interesting experience. Um, I had the opportunity to move over to a different bank at the time. Um, I had interned at Barclays and moved over to, to Goldman to be a um, an analyst. And, um, you know, the I've just kind of been steadily following the path of where are there interesting hard problems that I'm going to learn a lot doing these things. And that's been more of a wandering path than a specific intent of, you know, from age seven, here's where I wanted to be when I was 35. The other dimension that I was thinking about and I wanted to ask you is the emotional intelligence. Um, and I, I find that this varies with the, with the type of role and obviously with data science being such a huge field, uh, there are areas of data science where it's more important and are areas where it's less important. Where, where um, do you place it at based on your, uh, your experience, your career, and, and what do you see as, as uh, going forward? Yeah, so when you look at the at the hiring research again, like the there are two real categories, right? The one is um, things you don't interview for, which are the intellectual horsepower things, and those are you know how smart you are. Do you have sp some specific skills I need? The word that always comes up on the other side is conscientiousness, and that encompasses mm -hmm. the stuff that we talked about at the beginning and the emotional intelligence, teamwork parts of it, and yeah. those are the things that you actually do interview for. Um, which is counterintuitive to a lot of people who work in um, quanti type roles because you want to ask people really hard questions and see if they're yes. smart. But yes. but the problem is the data doesn't support that as being actually predictive of anything when you control for their grades. And so what is what is actually shown to be better is judging people on their ethics, judging people on their um, communication skills and on their willingness to work in teams and things like that. And that again, it's going to depend on the type of role you're doing. If you are trying to make Google search 1% more efficient, you need to be a PhD with really awesome intellectual horsepower, and you still need to be able to work on a team. You still need to be able to communicate with people, but that may be, you know, 70-30 instead of 30-70. Mm -hmm. 
my world is usually more around the middle where I need people who can do data science, but also you know, I still cover clients as an investment banker as well. And so I need to be able to both you know, work on data science and do modeling and testing and um, core infrastructure and you know, parts of full stack development, and then go out and talk to a CEO about their, you know, the way that they're interacting with their investors and have this conversation. And you know, that skill set of just being able to route any project to any person on my team is something, again, that I really value. And this is the same thing as with the growth mindset. I want to be able to, from the technical side, route problems to people without having to worry about, do they know this one specific thing? Mm -hmm. And also from the whether on from the client side of it, whether, you know, hey, can I give this person client projects? Everyone on my team needs to be able to do both. They might be better at one or the other, and I might over allocate them one way or the other, especially at the beginning. But over time, you know, I really need everyone to be pretty good at both at least. And because of that, you know, when I interview, it's something I do spend a lot of time. Tell me how was it going to India and and setting up uh, setting up a team there? What did that look like? Um, how long did it take? What 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 did you expect before you left? And then what, what were you, what were the, some of the realities that you were faced with while you were there? I got there and basically my job was to do my job, just to show up and do work every day and show people what that means and how you know I worked with different folks and just integrate them into the different things that I was doing. Um, mm. And you know it was a pretty incredible experience because the talent that we were able to recruit there was just truly insane. I mean, we the, the example I like to use, we used to give people this placement test there that we would give to pre-screen who we would interview. Um, and it was the 30 question math test that we would give to all the new candidates. And I took it on a whim just to see how I do and just got a straight zero. Did not answer a single question. <laughs> and, you know, we'd get people coming through who would answer 25 of 30 correctly. Like, I mean, the, the level of talent was incredible. And we yeah. focused really heavily there on hiring people who were also really good communicators, really good um, on, the, on the other softer factors. But even with that constraint, we were still getting just incredibly talented people, people who were, you know, rank 100 out of a million on the national test there. And, um, you know, I okay. learned so much working with these people because they just knew so many different things that I didn't. But also I was able yeah. to really push them on, you know, things like intellectual curiosity, things like pushing back. You know, I remember one of the first projects mm -hmm. I did with somebody there, um, I asked them to do something and they come back to me about 24 hours later and they're like, yeah, it didn't work. I'm like, what do you mean it didn't work? And I was like, and they were like, uh, well, you know, you asked me to do it this way, so that obviously wasn't going to work, but, you know, I did it and it didn't work. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me that? And they were like, well, because you told me to do it that way. Um, and that was like a real aha moment where you know, there, yes. are, there are cultural differences that you have to work through. And um, one of the things that I really worked hard to establish early on was that you guys are really smart and know a lot of things and you need to be willing to come forward and, tell us them and tell us when I'm being an idiot because that's going to be most of the time. And if you know the right answer, you know, we want to make sure that your ideas are coming in. You're not just someone here to just execute on my vision. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And that really unlocked a lot of horsepower there. And we, we had a really just truly incredible team there who was able to produce tons and tons of awesome work and um, made a lot of good friends along the way. Um, not going to say it's not a really challenging place to be. It's not like, that it would be my first choice of a vacation spot necessarily. I mean, you can go and do, you know, a yoga retreat there and not ever actually see the country and have a very different experience. You know, we lived in the in the town and you know went out to eat with our friends there and stuff. And it's a really cool, interesting place. Amazing food. Really awesome to see the way that development is happening there and how fast it's moving, but also things that aren't developing. Um, but also, you know, you see things like really intense poverty that you just don't see at the same levels in the U.S. I think if there's one thing that's been successful for me in my career, it's been uh, riding on other people's shoulders. So, um, you know, you if you bring if you create the space for people to bring their own thoughts and intellectual curiosity to bear, there there is no state of the world where I will have enough ideas to drive everything. And yeah. the more that I can focus on bringing people forward to, to promote their own ideas and push their own ideas, yeah, 99% of the things that people come up with and the things that I come up with aren't going to necessarily be the right path. But the sheer volume of good ideas from different smart people, from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking about the world is just really vital. 
end, I think there's there's like an important piece that that meshes into this that's a little bit subtle, which is, and it's it's sort of a philosophical question about what is the purpose of a data science team and how do you structure it, which is um, there's a lot of play, there's a lot of debate about the centralization of data science versus the distribution of it among teams. Yes. And I'm very heavily on the distribution side of it in that if I had that team over there of a closed group of experts where we went to them with ideas and had them execute those things and bring them back, we would get really great product from that, but it wouldn't be as useful as if we had these people actually integrated into the different businesses they were working with, working day to day with the people on those teams, working on client projects and actually understanding the stuff they were doing. Not only would that allow them to execute better on projects that were brought to them, but also to identify other areas where they could add value. Um, and I think more broadly, if you centralize your data science team, you're going to end up with data science experts that don't have you know, area specific skills, which again, if you're making Google search 1% more efficient, that might be the right thing. But in my world, having people who are good enough at data science, but also can understand how bonds get marketed, for example, is more valuable than just having that narrow group of experts where you have to go through the bureaucracy of staffing somebody and bringing them in on this project and then they have to do a big six month bill. Um, you know, I'd rather have people in that in the day-to-day -day flow. Man, that that is fantastic. And do you think that at the um, an organization that's more mature in the in their data journey or or is further along, do you think that is the type of organization that that gets more value out of a decentralized team or i guess the question is what are is there is there a a, a point um a, or or situations for which a centralized team is is better and then um and then a point of where a transition is uh, necessary in in order to get to a to a distributed team which which i do think that is definitely the the longer term um, be, uh, way way to structure it, um, but is there is there a particular um, area or or place for a centralized team, and then does it go into a distributed team? A lot of it's going to depend on the type of work you do, and I I generally split the world into two kind of rough categories of data science. There's predictive and there's descriptive work, and mm -hmm. the more predictive you are, the more expert work you need. Because if you're working on trying to predict whether a stock is going to go up you're going to be doing really hard data science because you're taking something everyone else is looking at and trying to predict it a little bit better. If you're just trying to solve day-to-day -day business problems by kind of roughly explaining the way the world works with data, there a more federated model is often going to be better because understanding the right questions to ask is more important and then you can just point standard models and simple approaches at the right problems and the right questions to answer. And so yeah. both of those things have their places. Now, to your point around evolution, um, it's two parts. One is that you need to have a centralized team at the beginning because you need someone who can you know, set up your servers and make sure that your web services work. And you know, that's not going to be someone who sits in one of these, uh, these federated teams. You do need some engineering horsepower that's there to really work with you. Um, but from there, I've generally tried very quickly to move to as much of a federated model as possible. And mm -hmm. the way I do that is by doing fewer things. So I would rather work with a narrower scope of businesses and go really deep into those areas than to lightly touch the whole business. And in turn, then instead of me being like slow and reactive and only being able to do simplistic stuff, I can go into one area and really create value and show a difference there and have everyone look at that from the outside and say, oh, I want that too. And ideally that can create demand and we can go and say, yeah, we'd be happy to do this. We'll need another couple of people to do it, um, but we're happy to. It gives you the ability to identify someone who's, an, who's a real early adopter and yeah. help make them money, make them good at what they're doing, make them look good. And you're also going to get a little bit of a longer rope with them because they're excited and invested in what you're doing. Particularly if they have written the check for your team, they are now their own career is aligned with you being successful as opposed to you trying to prove yourself to them. And then have everybody else feel like they have to that they want to go and bring you in as opposed to you trying to sell yourself to them all the time. Um, and you know, in that way, 
you start with the early adopters, you make them look really good, and the next round of people, instead of you trying to sell themselves to them, your work sells them. They're looking at it and saying, oh, that person is doing these really cool things. I guess I need to get on that train, as opposed to me going to them and saying, hey, this train's going that way, and it's a pretty cool train, you better get on it. Yeah, I love it. And how, how did you pick the early adopters? My approach there was, let's do small projects and prototypes for everyone. And then and then they will emerge. And I found That's that I what was you do. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you follow a similar similar path? Yeah. I mean, you 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 start by by spraying things around and just working with a lot of people just to get the volume in and see who those people are and meet people. And then as you work a little bit with people, you start to understand their own types of workflow. So someone who's excited about it but has very specific things of this exactly done this way, like not going to start there. Someone who is like, hey, I have all these cool things. Can you just like solve all these problems for me? Not going to start there. You know, someone who's just aloof and not interested, free. Don't need to don't need to convince everybody. And you try a bunch of these little projects. And then when you find one that really hits and really, you know, connects, then you really push to say, okay, now what's the next one here? What's the next one here? What's the next one here? And once you get that fish on the line, then you just really got to um, invest heavily in making uh, the work you do benefit that person and make it clear that you know it's it's actually worth them being involved with you. Going back to the distinction that you mentioned around uh, uh, prescriptive and predictive uh, analytics, is that is that distinction uh, reflected in your in your team structure um, or or is it more ad hoc? How does that work um, within within the team? Yeah, so that's a great question and. More of the predictive stuff is generally going to sit closer to the hub than in the spokes because, you know, again, it's more of a specialty. Um, but also, when I hire, I always look to hire a spectrum of people, right? You're, and part of this is, you know, if you're casting that wide net, if I'm going to hire smart people with intellectual curiosity, et cetera, you're going to get a spectrum of people who are really heavy engineering backgrounds and people who aren't. And mm. because of that, you're going to have very different specialties within the team. And when, and, mm -hmm. you know, predictive analytics is within data science, I think the, the specialty really. And so I have some people who are going to be better at that than others. I'm going to do a lot of that myself too. And, um, you know, as the, when I have projects that are directly related to that, I'm just going to route them towards the right people and make sure that I have the right mm -hmm. people working on them. Now, if that were a bigger part of our day-to-day -day job and we were doing more and more of that, then I would probably aim to have some specific focus people who did that full-time in the hub as opposed to being federated out because having someone who's a really good predictive modeler working on stuff that isn't predictive modeling is not going to be the right use of their talents. But yeah. in any one of these federated areas, I'm never going to have enough pure predictive problems to justify that person's time. How do you see the the use of, of data and um and what could be called uh, data data governance. What are your views? Yeah, so if you put rules around data, people will always find ways to get around them to do the things that they want to do. And so to me, rules are very important, but the most important thing is really building a culture of data ethics and making sure that people are thinking about, is this the right thing to be doing with it? You know, the limiting factor isn't, am I compliant? It's, is this the right thing to do? Um, and in some cases, there are real obvious commercial implications for that. You know, we have at Citi, for example, huge amounts of credit card data, right? Huge amounts of corporate transaction data. Well, if I took that data and used it for the wrong purpose and showed it to a client and they get super creeped out that we're using their data that way, right? They're going to take business away from us and take it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think are the there are these really deep ethical questions we're going to start seeing over the next few years. And, and there are a couple of, there have been a couple of examples that really have come up over the last year or so. I think the most, the most valuable one that people really need to be learning from is what happened with the launch of Apple cards. Um, and if you recall, when Apple cards launched, it became immediately apparent that their algorithm that they were using for allocating credit capacity was dramatically favoring men. Um, and I promise you that the people there never put a factor in their model for give more money to men. The problem is that they built a model to reflect, reflect reality and mm -hmm. reality is biased. And yep. so if you feed bias data in, you get biased predictions out, even if you're not using biased factors. And this goes back to the governance and compliance thing. So governance says, I cannot use race as a factor in my model. 
compliance says I should validate that my model does not have race as an output factor from it being driven by something else. And so the idea that you that the person on the ground is going to care about this stuff is more important mm -hmm. to me than that there are rules surrounding that person. And obviously you need the rules because you do have to be compliant as well. But more powerful than compliant is having the culture of, of good ethics there on the ground. How do you go about establishing that, that culture of, of data ethics and helping people um, continually have in the forefront of their minds um, the implications of, of their work downstream to, to real people and, and um, looking for, for things like, like bias and fairness? Well, the first thing is you hire good people. Um, you hire humans who are actually like good humans who care about stuff and who care about these types of things and you're hiring for culture. And that's a huge part of, of what you have to do. Um, and then the other part is is just simple leading by example. I mean, asking that question, hey, is your model being biased in this way? And make sure that people know that you care about it. And if you genuinely care about those things, that will reflect downstream. And when people see that you genuinely care about them, then they care, even if they don't care about those things themselves, they care about how you think about them and they're going to therefore integrate that caring into what they do and it becomes self-perpetuating culture in that way. Projects in general, what is, what is, what is your, your cadence or your approach during the week in terms of um, touch points with the, with the people in your team, either individually, as a group? Uh, do, you, do you set up meetings per, per project for people to discuss? Um, do you invite stakeholders to those meetings or does the team have them by themselves? How do you, how do you structure that, that side um, for yourself? My main goal is to have as high a percentage of my team's time spent building things as possible and as little time spent doing bureaucracy as possible. Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit about how some of that has changed in the period of COVID right now because I, I, mm. I have had to make some changes to accommodate the different working environment. but. Mm. We have we have a weekly meeting where everyone sits down and you know talks about projects that they're working on, and that's a really important part of what we do. But the majority of it is just chatting day to day. You know, I set aside time every day to walk by people's desks and say, you know, hey, what are you guys working on? What are you doing? How can I help? And just spend a couple minutes talking through projects with people, and you get a much more natural understanding of their projects and where they're stuck on things and what they're thinking about. Um, mm -hmm when you just have those kind of informal conversations versus them coming and presenting to you as to here's what I want you to know about my project. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, by having fewer layers of management in between, your goal is to have people who are comfortable working with the folks in the business. They ask questions for themselves, they investigate stuff for themselves. And mm -hmm. you know, I always tell them to come to me with a come to me with an answer or suggestion. If you come to me and say, how do I do this thing? I'm going to tell you to fuck off for lack of a yeah. better word, if you come to me and say, here are the three ways I thought about this that aren't working, you know, do you have any ideas of how it could be done differently? Or here's how I think I should do this thing, you cool with that. Um, and that to me is a much better style and it requires a lot less management, but it also frees up people to feel like they actually have intellectual ownership over their work versus just being executors of a project. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, executors, the person who executes, you know, it just being told, yeah. here's what I do when I do this task versus here's what we are trying to accomplish. Help help us figure out how we get there. Man, I just I just looked at the, at the time. I'm going to be respectful of your time. This has been amazing, like a, a really a, a blast. I, I I love your perspectives, your approach. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your, your journey, your insights, the way you roll, man. It's definitely what we need more of in the industry. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Dan. Yeah, thank you for inviting me on. This was, uh, this was a, real, a real pleasure. That brings this episode to conclusion. Thank you so much for listening. Please find us on datafuturology.com or on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram as Data Futurology. Also go to datafuturology.com forward slash podcast to find the show notes for this and any other episodes. If you liked this episode, it would mean a lot to us if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to our podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that it was helpful and valuable for you. Thanks again and see you next time.